Yeah, thanks a lot. Let's get started for lecture number two on uh, modularity and strings. So a big thanks to Roberto for this morning's lecture, which uh, laid a lot of uh, foundations for what I plan to present today. So it's fantastic that you saw a crash course in conformal field theory. So I will every now and then get back to some wisdom that you heard this morning from uh, Roberto. And we will, of course, uh, build upon the material from yesterday, where I gave you some overview why the modular group at genus 1 is an SL2Z, uh, why it acts on the modular parameter tau of a torus through a fractional uh, transformation, a tau plus b divided by c tau plus d, and I gave you some uh, overview of modular forms that depend only on tau and no other variable. And I tried to highlight that there's a huge difference whether you are in a holomorphic case, a function holomorphic of tau at the upper half plane plus the cusp at i infinity. And in that case, um, being a holomorphic modular form has drastic implications. At weight zero, they are constant. And at uh, higher weight, there is a very low dimensional vector space with a holomorphic Eisenstein series at one, as one representative. And starting from weight 12, there are also cusp forms that you can build out of holomorphic Eisenstein series, namely as polynomials in two ring generators, G4 and G6. So all this to say, holomorphic case of modular forms is super constrained. And uh, all of that rigidity is lost if you allow for non-holomorphicity. It's uh, mildly lost in the meromorphic case that you heard about from Roberto this morning, and it's heavily lost in the non-holomorphic case where you refer to both tau and tau bar independently, where I try to get to some examples in the next lecture, which the world sheet from one loop string amplitudes gives you. But uh, for now, I would like to uh, move on to functions in two variables, namely functions not only of the modular parameter tau, but also on the torus coordinate. And uh, spoiler, the upshot of the first uh, 20 minutes will again be that in the meromorphic case, um, functions of uh, z are highly constrained, whereas in the non-holomorphic case you can almost do whatever you want to be quantified. Okay, so uh, what I want to discuss now is um, functions that additionally depend on one torus coordinate. So we follow the usual parameterization that you saw yesterday. Let's parameterize the torus through a parallelogram in the complex plane. Use uh, rescaling to have one of the periods to be one. So this was the A cycle in yesterday's drawing. And then um, you release control over the B cycle. This is that modular parameter uh, tau as a B period. And uh, now if I want to hand you a function that lives on the torus, and it's a function of z and tau, well, you should first of all double check whether it's well-defined, what I'm handing you. So, a function f of z and tau is well-defined on uh, the torus. I think throughout the lecture series, I will use t tau as a shorthand for the torus. And yeah, being well-defined, means that it should better be doubly periodic in the first argument uh, z. Um, okay, so it means that necessary condition for f being well-defined on the torus is that if I feed it with variables in the complex plane, it should have these two double periodicities. Because only then um, all the information is contained in the parallelogram here. Okay, and it's uh, about such functions well defined on the torus where I want to distinguish the meromorphic case from the real analytic one. And yeah, for both cases I have some definitions, and in the meromorphic case I have a theorem for you. Okay, let's start with the meromorphic case. And here, the terminology is 
we speak of elliptic functions if uh, they are both meromorphic and doubly periodic. And here is a huge terminology issue in this field. You often hear buzzwords like elliptic integrals, elliptic polylogarithms, and whatnot. And in those cases, elliptic unfortunately doesn't follow that definition. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> uh, for instance, an elliptic polylogarithm won't be doubly periodic. You catch some um, periods as you wind around A and B cycles. But at least uh, for the scope of the next 20 minutes, I think I will consistently stick to that. Okay, so what can I tell you about elliptic functions? And um, here is an important corollary of Liu Will's theorem. Namely, if I hand you an elliptic function and furthermore assure you that it doesn't have any poles, Uh, having no poles for elliptic function means that there are no poles in the parallelogram or potentially its boundary. Okay, and if it doesn't have any poles in this uh, compact domain, uh, parallelogram including boundary, well, it can't have uh, poles anywhere in uh, the complex plane, so it's bounded. And it's uh, holomorphic and... Um, bounded, which means by Liouville that uh, it's constant. Or more precisely, constant in Z. Uh, it may, of course, depend um, on tau. So, there are some examples of uh, constant functions in Z, which upon closer inspection evaluate to an Eisenstein series G4 of tau. But one loosely speaks of constant when the focus is on the z-dependence. Okay, so classifying uh, elliptic functions without pole is done. Then um, we should better introduce some poles to have non-boring examples. And uh, let's start with a double pole example. Double pole at the origin and then obviously, at all its images under A and B cycle uh, shift. And here, this is the famous Weierstrass function. It's really famous because there is a LaTeX shorthand for this uh, artistic P here. LaTeX syntax like this. I guess this is a good measure for being famous if it has an own LaTeX command. Now, what is that? Um, I was announcing it as an uh, elliptic function with a double pole. So here is an exposed double pole at the origin. And now uh, the expectation is that it's doubly periodic and it will be accomplished in a very brutal way. Let's just enforce double periodicity by adding all images under translating by A cycle or translating by B cycle. Let's just add all images under these identifications here where we want periodicity. So this is enforced to be doubly periodic, but at the moment there's a slightly dodgy aspect to that. This sum as it stands is not absolutely convergent. Yeah, we are summing over this two-dimensional lattice and we have a square uh, in the denominator, so there is a convergence issue unless I do this subtraction here. So now it is absolutely convergent and uh, we can relax. Okay, um, we can at the same time look at a Laurent expansion around the origin. So this is uh, quite easy because everything here in the summand is smooth at z equal to zero. So the Laurent expansion will give you uh, order by order in Z, some lattice sum of that type. And uh, in fact, the coefficients in this Laurent expansion are just the good old holomorphic Eisenstein series that got introduced yesterday. 
Okay, so you can also view the Weierstrass function as a generating function of holomorphic Eisenstein series. Okay, uh, we went from constant functions to uh, double pole functions. Maybe you were missing the simple pole. And in fact, I can't give you any elliptic functions of one marked point that have just a single simple pole. There don't exist any elliptic functions with one simple pole. But uh, devil is in the detail. There is a way out. There is a way to engineer um, elliptic functions with simple poles, namely by having several marked points. So a cheap way out of this no-go theorem is we just say let's have several uh, simple poles at distinct uh, points inside uh, the torus. And uh, the only condition is that the sum of the residues should be zero. Okay, there's a simple proof. We can go through it in the discussion session if you like. You essentially do a Cauchy uh, theorem for the contour integral around the, the boundary of the parallelogram. If a function is elliptic, then going over the four boundary components of the parallelogram will give zero, because the antipodal edges cancel one another. But I can also collapse this contour over the boundary of the par parallelogram to mini circles around all the simple poles. So in this way, I pick up the sum of all residues. Okay, so on these grounds, uh, if I only admit a single marked point Z, and I don't open these possibilities, then there are no um, elliptic functions with a simple pole. Okay, we discussed simple pole and double pole. Now here is a fun anecdote about higher order poles. So what about taking the derivative of the Weierstrass function? Well, if P has a double pole, then P prime has a triple pole. And let's now compare triple poles coming from P prime with double poles coming from P. So how can I generate a pole at the same order from P as I have in P prime? Well, I need to go all the way to a sixth order pole. Both of them have one over Z to the six. And uh, if I'm a bit careful with the relative factor, then there is no more uh, sixth order pole, or sorry, it's the same sixth order pole on both sides. Good, is this regular? Hmm? You know the Laurent expansion, you can just insert the above, and in fact there is still a leftover double pole as it stands. So let's make sure that also the double poles are consistent on left-hand side and right-hand side. And now it's looking quite good. Left-hand side minus right-hand side has no more pole whatsoever. So now we are back to the case of a constant. And the constant can actually be computed. Just take the uh, zeroth order in Z by Laurent expanding everything you see. And then you find that that is the missing constant. So this must be true because left-hand side minus right-hand side has no poles. And furthermore, it cannot be a non-vanishing constant, because we can compute the z to the zero order terms on both sides. Yeah, so here this is a powerful application of the above uh, theorem. And just imagine we didn't have the theorem, it would be a nightmare to check this by direct computation. But uh, yeah, with these... Um, no go statements get differential equations like that one almost uh, for free. And yeah, this has extremely uh, important implications. It means that if you want to poke at cubic equations like y square equal x cube plus lower order, then it's the Weierstrass function which uh, uniformizes these uh, cubic equations in the same way as sine and cosine uniformize a quadratic equation. 
Good. Uh, there are many reasons to be excited about this uh, differential equation of the Weierstrass uh, function. And I want to squeeze out one corollary in front of your eyes. Um, okay, I already Laurent expanded to convince you that this is true. But let's also look at a simple corollary. Namely, if I differentiate once more in Z, then we can see that the second Weierstrass derivative is essentially Weierstrass square up to a constant. And now imagine you Laurent expand both sides. We have uh, Eisenstein series coming from each P and well left hand side will be linear in Eisenstein series. But right hand side has a perfect square so it's going to be quadratic in Eisenstein series. So now Let's read out various Laurent coefficients of that equation. We find uh, things like, if you expand high enough, then, let's see, I have linear in Eisenstein on the left-hand side, then it's more logical to write it like that. Yeah, so for instance, uh, this is what you learn from comparing z to the fourth terms on both sides of the equation. and. Uh, similar things at higher order, there's always the same theme that a single Eisenstein series of weight 8 or higher is expressible through a bilinear in lower weight Eisenstein series. Yeah, and this is a never-ending source of equations, just go at higher and higher order in Z. Good. Um, yeah, this hopefully um, reminds you of what you saw yesterday, that G4 and G6 are the ring generators for holomorphic modular forms. And this is part of the proof of that. It guarantees that Eisenstein series of arbitrary weight are expressible in terms of G4 and G6. But admittedly, this is not yet proving that uh, other holomorphic modular forms also boil down to G4 and G6. So for the rest of the proof, you need to work a little bit harder. But you find it, for instance, in the textbook by uh, Doka Kaidi or in, I hope, many other resources. But yeah, just to convince you that uh, part of the ring structure is already derivable from these down-to-earth moves involving Weierstrass functions. Okay, uh, the last thing I want to say about the uh, meromorphic case or about the realm of elliptic functions is perhaps it looked like I was jumping up and down at a specific example, Weierstrass. How generic or exotic is the Weierstrass function? And yeah, the last comment on this implies that Weierstrass is most you can do when you have elliptic functions of one variable. Namely, all elliptic functions can be expressed using p and p prime as a rational function of the two. So again, uh, it's the case of one marked point on the torus. Uh, elliptic functions of that can be written as rational functions of p and p prime. Okay, I won't attempt to prove it uh, here, but also there, it's not rock and science to carry out uh, the proof. And again, the big helper is that um, the difference between what you get from here and a completely generic elliptic function can be shown to have no more poles, and then it's a constant. Yeah, it's all going back to this corollary of Liouville's uh, theorem. Okay, um, as you see from all of this, there is really a lot of control for meromorphic uh, doubly periodic functions, aka elliptic ones. And uh, now I would switch gears and 
tell you a bit about non-meromorphic cases thereof, where all that rigidity is unfortunately absent. Well, maybe fortunately, because there are uh, exciting classification problems ahead of us in the non-meromorphic case. Okay, so again, um, we want to demand double periodicity. And in fact, I will embed this in a slightly larger definition of Jacobi forms. Okay, I think they were already there in Roberto's uh, talk this morning. <coughs> so a function, a non-holomorphic function on two variables, z and uh, tau, is called a uh, Jacobi form. And I need to specify weights, modular weights. And now there are, again, two of them. If there's tau and tau bar that I can independent, uh, independently play with. And, well, I could give an even more general definition if I were to allow non-zero index, but I don't dare to. So here, all the Jacobi forms you'll see in my lecture series have index zero. Okay, so what's part of the definition? Part one is, again, double periodicity. And part two of the definition of a Jacobi form is, yeah, modular behavior, where the obvious part is that we do the usual SL2 action on tau. But at the same time, let's carry out the SL2 action on Z, which was motivated yesterday. So this was uh, needed to ensure that the A period is one before and after modular transformation. Okay, so here um, the modular weights show up as the exponents of the universal uh, automorphy factor, so this is probably not a surprise if you look back at the non-holomorphic modular forms from yesterday. And uh, okay, to be really cautious, let's furthermore put in a third element to the definition that at the cusp, um, the singularity structure is not going too crazy, has at most a pole at the cusp. Good, that's definition of um, Jacobi form specified by a holomorphic and the anti-holomorphic modular weight. And that clearly cries out for examples. Well, you saw yesterday, uh, in absence of Z dependence, a nice example is im tau, which transforms with uh, modular weights minus one comma minus one. But here I wanna give you a genuinely Z dependent example. And well, the simplest one I can think of you have just seen, Namely, the Weierstrass function is kind enough to do that for you. Weierstrass is a meromorphic special case of Jacobi forms of vanishing index, namely, where the respective modular weights are 2 and 0. Which is to say that, following the definition over there, that the Weierstrass function Oops, does the following. And you can easily check that, for instance, using the series expansion in terms of Eisenstein series. So term by term, this Laurent series uh, is satisfying that equation here. Okay, uh, maybe this is not sufficiently satisfactory because it happens to be meromorphic and I promised you real analytic functions. So here is something which contains all of z, z bar, tau and tau bar, namely um, Zagier's uh, single-valued elliptic polylogarithms. Uh, well, you don't need to know this mouthful of words, um, how they are called, but more importantly, here is one way to engineer doubly periodic functions. What if we do a double Fourier expansion? A double Fourier expansion in the variables that tell us how far we have gone into A cycle direction and how far we have gone into B cycle direction. 
So let's introduce real variables, u and v, that track how far we went into a and b direction. So I will also call them co-moving coordinates. So by construction, u and v are real and in the unit interval. And um, if you go through this uh, domain for u and v, I mean that square, then you have exhausted the parallelogram. Okay, with these co-moving coordinates, a cheap way of enforcing uh, double periodicity is to Fourier expand. Fourier expand both in U and V. So for every integer m and n, this is doubly periodic. However, this is not meromorphic in Z, because um, imagine you try to solve U as a function of Z, Z bar, tau, and tau bar then already u is a bit of a shocker. Well, take the imaginary part of this defining equation, and then in order to represent u, then you need to say both and z bar and tau bar. So hence, this cheap way of enforcing double periodicity comes at the cost of meromorphicity in both variables, z and tau. Good, so this was a bunch of comments on plane waves here. And of course, if I do a Fourier expansion, I need to tell you the Fourier coefficients. So now I need to give you Fourier coefficients labeled by both m and n. And this class of functions that Zagier introduced, and that are also somewhat natural in string theory, as I will detail later on, we can decide that the Fourier coefficients are these uh, lattice vectors that you already saw in case of the holomorphic and non-holomorphic Eisenstein series. So you can view these gadgets as a z-dependent generalization of uh, Eisenstein series with the same momentum-spaced representation if we generously call these m tau plus n momenta. Okay, this is for each uh, pair of KL a um, Jacobi form. The weights are on the nose K and L, and maybe we need to be once more careful that the lattice sum actually converges. So let's here postulate that K plus L is bigger than two. Then that sum here converges uh, absolutely. And actually, being equal to two is also not too bad in case of the closed string greens function, as you will see either today or tomorrow. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Here we go. As always, uh, make sure that nothing uh, blows up. Good. Um, these were some examples of uh, Jacobi forms. And even though all kinds of integer pairs of weights have appeared up to now, let me stress that is, this is still a set of measure zero. We are miles away from having a solid classification of uh, Jacobi forms. So that's uh, another uh, exciting open problem. I mean, there are several ways in which the Zagier functions are incomplete. Uh, first of all, you can deviate from being integer k and l and look at, well, non-integer. But also, you can view those as tau integrals of simpler Jacobi forms. And then you can form double integrals, triple integrals, higher order iterated integrals. So there are many, many mechanisms to generate huge families of uh, Jacobi forms. And yeah, there are really several directions uh, to explore. And most importantly, this nice classification in the meromorphic case, governed by the Weierstrass function, has no analog whatsoever in the real analytic case. So no analog of, well, the slogan of above was that elliptic equal rational in P prime and P. So there is no 
analog whatsoever of that. Okay, now I believe I'm uh, done with this uh, first look at uh, functions on the torus. I hope this illustrated the huge differences between meromorphic and non-meromorphic cases. And uh, yeah, I think the next uh, topic on my list is to go into world chain modularity. Unless there are any further questions on this. Okay, so um, the um, main example to tell you about world sheet modularity is the, the one loop four point function of type two superstrings, or more generally, one loop string amplitudes, including cases with no external legs, aka vacuum amplitudes. But yeah, in the non-vacuum case, once more, the cartoon of that business is doing a topological expansion of string amplitudes, where the leading order in the string coupling is governed by the Riemann sphere, having as many marked points to integrate over as there are external states. And we will spend most of our time on that subleading order in the string coupling GS where we need to look at a torus with as many mark points as there are external legs. And once more, the task is to integrate over the moduli space of this. And uh, let me be a bit more precise and tell you a nice coordinate choice on that moduli space. So if we have n points rather than four, <clears throat> then the concrete uh, integration uh, you can do is take the modular parameter tau to be one of the coordinates of m1 comma n and integrate that over the keyhole region or the fundamental domain of SL2Z that you saw yesterday. And then the leftover coordinates are the marked points, but not all of them, because um, there will always be translation invariance on the torus. Or in other words, you can, without loss of generality, uh, fix one of the marked points to anywhere on the torus. So, for instance, pick the first marked point and set it to the origin. Good. And those which we don't fix to the origin, uh, you integrate over n minus 1 copies of the parallelogram parametrizing the torus. Okay, so this is the agenda in the evaluation of uh, one-loop string amplitudes. And so far, I haven't said anything about how to determine the integrand. So here is where some conformal field theory machinery is at work, uh, which I will try to give you a glimpse of. And uh, whatever the CFT ends up outputting, it should better be compatible with modular invariance. So this is the basic uh, principle the, well, moduli space integrand should be well defined. And in particular, the integrand with respect to F, the domain for the tau integration for this distinguished coordinate, the integrand for F should better be modular invariant. And in the, in the bigger scheme of things, you are free to choose any fundamental domain of SL2. If you don't like the keyhole region, you saw at least three alternatives in yesterday's figure. It should, in principle, be possible to take another one. But equality between these choices requires you to have a, 
uh, modular invariant integrand. And the concrete reward, as I already tried to highlight yesterday, is the absence of UV divergences. And um, it can be shown that um, the ultraviolet uh, regime of a one-loop string amplitude is governed by values of tau very close to the real axis. So the smaller the imaginary part of tau, the more in the UV you are with these contributions. You can, for instance, check that by comparing the Schwinger parameterizations of Feynman integrals. So um, tau is dangerous if it's getting close to the real axis. But a nice thing about that fundamental domain is that we are cutting out that region. We start at values of im tau well above one half. So um, we are cutting out that region in, well, the construction of F, and hence uh, one can see from the distance that there is no danger whatsoever to run into a UV divergence. And again, it doesn't imply finiteness altogether because UV is not the only potentially dangerous region, and you will actually see an example in the bosonic string that things can diverge even if it's not the fault of the UV. But at, at least the main obstacle in generic approaches to quantum gravity, namely taming of UV divergences, that's not an issue in perturbative string theory. Okay, um, before going for the actual feast and do four gravitons in type 2b super strings, let's do a warm up, warm up in several directions that uh, we look at bosonic strings and we furthermore look at the vacuum energy of the bosonic string amplitude at one loop. So, um, the, my goal is to now walk you step by step through different ingredients that are involved in such one loop amplitude calculations. And uh, a first question about loop amplitudes in general is, who is running in the loop? So in field theory, you do Feynman rules and have a finite number of particles running through the loops. And well, in string theory case, it's an infinite number of states that are running and we need a certain amount of control on such states. So uh, here in the bosonic string case, uh, the states who may run in the loop can be enumerated as follows. Um, so I'm sticking to Minkowski uh, background in the critical dimension d equal uh, 26. And uh, how can I enumerate the bosonic string states that are running through the loop? First of all, there is a ground state that carries space-time momentum. Oh, yeah, I hope I will manage to always keep space-time momentum from world sheet momentum apart. So this P here lives in 26 dimensions. And then there are oscillators actually infinity of oscillator modes. Uh, traditionally, these oscillators are denoted by alpha minus n. These are oscillators in the mode expansion of the embedding coordinate of the string. And actually, each embedding coordinate x has two towers of oscillators, usually denoted alpha and alpha bar. And uh, they are referred to as left movers and right movers. And one way of isolating them is to take holomorphic derivatives and anti-holomorphic derivatives of x. Okay, alpha and alpha bar. Whoops. Are the left and right movers. So the idea behind that is you solve the free wave equation which can be derived from an action principle. And then uh, solutions to a two-dimensional wave equation are, if you plot it, over spatial and time coordinate moving left or right. 
and instead, instead of using uh, time and spatial coordinate on the world sheet, you go for complex coordinates or light cone coordinates in 2D. So that's why you get left movers and right movers in isolation through this partial Z and partial Z bar. Okay, now I've pretended as if there was a single space-time dimension, but of course there are many of them, naively 26 of them, but I'm following light cone quantization. So I'm not picking up an oscillator for every single space-time direction, but I'm skipping two of them. So the idea here is that you can't take any oscillator combination in 26 dimensions, but there are a couple of physical state constraints, aka BRST constraints. And one way of solving all of the BRST constraints at the same time is to just knock out two directions in space-time. This is called light cone quantization in the sense of picking a light cone in space-time to decide who is not part of the range of I. So one can criticize that this is uh, camouflaging the Lorentz invariance of the theory in 26 dimensions. That's admittedly a pity that this is not manifest. But for the moment, our goal is state counting, and I guess that's acceptable that we are not doing so in a Lorentz covariant way. Hence, the alpha oscillators come from 24 left movers and 24 right movers, even though we are in the critical dimension 26. If we had done a miscount here, you would notice in a page or so that something is screwed up about modularity. Good, these are the states that will run in the loop. And now I'm computing for you a vacuum uh, amplitude, so to say no marked point on the torus, but there will still be the integral over tau. So now I want to tell you what's the contribution at fixed tau to the vacuum amplitude. So we need to determine the, in a certain sense, the partition function for the desired vacuum amplitude. And that is an object of a, the type that you saw in Roberto's lecture. If I remember correctly, he told you about Hamiltonian and momentum operator that you can construct out of the Vera Soro generators, L0 and L0 bar. So we once more have the Q variable for the exponential of 2 pi i tau, and we have special instances of the Vera Soro generators, L0 and L0 bar. Well, Roberto told you about all the L with non-zero subscripts, so you can take positive and negative integers as a subscript, and they will generate the Vera Soro algebra for you. And uh, for the one-loop amplitude games to be played today, I just need the L0. I need to track the eigenvalues of various ingredients here. Okay, now we need to take the trace of that, but over which space? Well, the space for the trace is qualitatively described above. Oh, it won't fit on the same board, but on the next one it will. Oh. <clears throat> over the space of states. Let's call that Hilbert space H bosonic. So here it's about all sequences of alpha oscillators which may have different indices i in the light cone, well, in the non-light cone directions. And we not only allow for uh, alphas but also alpha bars. So always uh, there's upstairs uh, i and j indices that tell you in which space some dimension they are pointing. And then there is a subscript referring to a Fourier mode on the world sheet. Yeah, and all of these act on that ground state, which is killed by all the alpha positives. So uh, I'm only keeping the alpha negatives to, well, keep the state non-trivial. 
Sorry that I cannot be completely self-contained. In a really thorough lecture, I would furthermore explain that there are bracket relations between the alpha positive and alpha negative. But let me just say, it's fine to leave out the alpha positives. Okay, and um, there is independent dynamics to, first of all, the choice of ground state. And for the moment, I even keep independent dynamics to the unbarred alphas and the barred ones. Okay, the experts will now start to shout, what about level matching? Connoisseurs will know that physical closed string states will have the same amount of alpha bar excitations as there are alpha excitations. But not now. There will be a way to impose level matching later. But this is just a remark for the experts. Don't worry if you haven't heard level matching before. It's intentional that no level matching is imposed at this stage. Okay, and um, in order to take a, tr a trace of Q to the L naught over that space, I need to tell you the eigenvalues of both L naught and L naught bar. So these eigenvalues are, there's always some contribution coming from the space-time momentum in the ground state. And then the more negative the subscript of the alpha, the higher the eigenvalue. So the unbarred alphas will raise the eigenvalue of the unbarred L0, and same, same, the barred alpha oscillators will raise the eigenvalue of L0 bar. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so with this uh, basic information, I hope I can convince you that we can do the following partial computations. Trace over that uh, factor space and multiply it, that with a trace of the same operator insertions of the remaining factor spaces. So all this to say, we will go through the different ingredients one by one and don't attempt to build Rome in a day. So step one is to deal with the space-time momenta. So in the first step, we just trace over different choices of the ground state. And perhaps a trace is an understatement, because here these states are labeled by continuous parameters, namely the momenta. So that trace is in fact an integral over the momentum quantum numbers. It's an integral over this part of the L0 eigenvalue and that part of the L0 bar eigenvalue. And upon closer inspection, this is a Gaussian integral. So I won't bother to track the exact prefactors because the only thing I really want to highlight is the dependence on tau. And yeah, doing this uh, with elementary methods for Gaussian integrals, it won't be hard for you to uh, reproduce the power minus 13, half the number of space-time dimensions. Or in general, yeah, since this is d over 2, the number of space-time dimensions divided by 2, you can already see right here that if I'm not careful about the number of space-time dimensions, I will mess up the modular weights of the tau integrand. Okay, so now we can do a check mark on this point, and the next move is to look at the alphas. Only the alphas, ignoring the alpha bars. Good, so what can Q to the L0 do on various combinations of alphas? And, um, okay, we go for alpha minus one first, then for alpha minus two, for alpha minus three, and so on and so forth. And we first check out what I can do involving only alpha minus one. So this is a bosonic operator. I can put it in, not at all. I can put it in once or twice or as many times as I wish. 
So this is a geometric series. So this is coming from arbitrary numbers of alpha minus one excitations, a geometric series that goes like that. Oops, one divided by one minus q. Of course, assuming that the series converges. But now this was taking care of a single um, alpha minus one, but in truth, we have 24 of them. So let's better take things to the 24th power. Okay, now the observation that alpha minus one can be excited as many times as I wish, that goes through for all the other alphas. So the same kind of game can be played here for alpha minus two, alpha minus three, all the alpha minus n's. And in each case, I can excite that oscillator once, or twice, or three times, and so on and so forth. And, uh, okay, let's remember that the eigenvalue of L0, it grows with that subscript. So these are, this is noted here. So for alpha minus n, you already get a power q to the n, if you only excite it a single time. Good. This means that now that is also a geometric series, but now with some q to the n in the denominator. So by putting all of that together, you get um, a product from n to 1 equal 1 to infinity. In the denominator, 1 minus q to the n, but it's not only once in the denominator, but 24 times for each space-time dimension once. Okay, and once more, that construction, or here, the answer for the tau integrand is very, very sensitive to the number of space-time dimensions. Even to the subtlety that BRST constraints somewhat kill the degrees of freedom of two space-time directions, since this is not a 26. Okay, to go back to the main theme of modularity, let's compare with modular forms we have seen before. I told you yesterday that the Ramanujan cusp form has exactly such an infinite product representation. Maybe I'm slightly off by an overall factor of q and 2 pi to the 12, but it's morally speaking the inverse delta 12. So this is really useful to assemble the partition function z and to then assess the modularity properties. Yeah, um, what I haven't spelled out, well, there is still the alpha bars, but uh, this is following the same principle, checking the contributions from alpha bar. They are communicating only with L naught bar and give you, well, the same end result with a complex conjugation for everything you see. Just repeat literally all these arguments here and exploit the fact that the alphas commute with the alpha bars in the same way as we exploited that the alphas associated with different space-time directions also commute. Okay, assemble everything. Or at least everything which has been on the past two blackboards. So the overall partition function given by that large trace can be factored into these individual traces which have been evaluated over there. So just the reminder, we are factorizing into contributions from P, from alpha, from alpha bar, and then take the respective traces of that. And okay, a last manual addition that needs to be made is uh, something about the vacuum energy on the world sheet. So I don't think I will attempt to give you a rigorous derivation. One way of telling the story is to look at the central charge, C and C bar, in Roberto's lecture. Or I wave uh, my hands at a higher frequency and refer to the fact that there is a tachyon 
which has a, a negative mass level, so to say. And um, this is taking into account either the negative vacuum energy on the world sheet or, um, yeah, referring to the tachyon at mass level minus one. Or the most coward move is to uh, invoke modularity, that if you choose any different power of Q and Q bar, then in the next line I will fail to get a modular form. Okay, if I do this insertion of Q and Q bar, then I'm losing these unpleasant insertions here. And when the dust settles, you only have modular forms in here. More precisely, real combinations involving Ramanujan cusp form and its complex conjugate of modular weight 12. And then here, imaginary part. And the very last thing uh, to settle is, this is to be integrated. Well, for n points, I would be integrating over m1 semicolon n. But here we are formally at zero points. It may sound like we have to do m1 semicolon zero, but um, this doesn't really exist because each torus comes with one marked point. By translation invariance, this is automatic. And this is not getting integrated, this one marked point. So this is an extra factor of one over im tau, what I'm mumbling here. So the measure to integrate has an extra one over volume of that torus. Since we, I'm explicitly saying that we are not integrating over that one marked point, which is automatic, and the volume of the torus is nothing but im tau. Okay, so this brings us to the end of the computation. The vacuum energy at one loop of the closed bosonic string is integral over the keyhole region with this measure here involving the im tau due to the mark point we are not integrating over. And then the rest is this uh, partition function evaluated above. Okay, um, by plugging in all our results, this is now the moment of truth, whether this is as modular invariant as we want it. And one way of distributing the different factors is like that. And um, big moment of relief. This integrand turns out to be modular invariant. Even better than that, it can be split into two contributions that are separately modular invariant. Namely, what's my reason to distribute the factors in the way I did? The first modular invariant is if I reorganize the measure like that, putting two inverse powers of im tau along with the d square tau, and this is by itself modular invariant, which follows from the transformation of this measure here. Maybe I missed to put this into yesterday's example. Well, tau itself transforms like a, a Möbius transformation, a tau plus b over c tau plus d. But d tau means you have to take the derivative of that uh, Möbius transform, and that, uh, using the determinant constraints for a, b, c, d, simplifies to that. 
Okay, and uh, just to state it once more, that the imaginary part transforms like that, with weight minus 1, comma, minus 1. And these two pieces of information imply that the measure here is modular invariant. So this was the first piece of the integrand over there. And then the second piece was that denominator here, involving absolute value square of the Ramanujan cusp form. And also that is modular invariant because delta 12 forms with weight 12. Okay. So, all this to say, you have now seen the outline of a computation where you put in some uh, information about the spectrum of a string theory in question, and then you deduce the vacuum en uh, energy from a certain trace as evaluated here. And here you see this principle of modular invariance in action. The spectrum of string theory has to be chosen really carefully to make that trace computation evaluate to a modular invariant as seen here. That's why there are not many perturbative string theories. It's damn hard to engineer a spectrum in lines with that modular invariance. Okay, um, a lot of good words about the integrand here, but I'm afraid doing the integral will give you infinity here. That's an example of a non-UV divergence. So the tau integral here is uh, divergent by the contribution from the cusp. So roughly speaking, the part that causes the divergence is the regime close to the cusp or at large values of im tau. So let me give you an approximation of the integrand at large values of im tau. And um, it's essentially the 1 over Q behavior of these um, cusp forms. So these 1 over Q, Q bars can also be written like that. So they grow exponentially with im tau. So it's intentionally of this. So it's uh, only the 1 over Q term which is dangerous because everything else is exponentially suppressed. So it's in one-to-one -one correspondence to the masses of the states in the loop that control whether the contribution is exponentially suppressed or whether it is, uh, well, exponentially exploding. So all of these well-behaved terms belong to the infinite tower of m square greater or equal zero states. So all those states in the string spectrum with non-negative m square, all of them are fine. So the, the, the divergence is entirely from here, and this is the fault of the tachyon. So I dare to say this is in fact an artifact uh, playing with a bosonic string. And that issue is no longer around as we proceed to the superstring, which we will do next. Yeah, so how can we live with the fact that the tachyon causes this divergence? It doesn't kill the bosonic string theory, but instead it's a warning that we have expanded around a wrong vacuum of that bosonic string theory. So roughly speaking, the tachyon, which has a negative m square, it's living at the tip of a Mexican hat potential. So it's a bit like doing Higgs theory while expanding around this tip of the Mexican hat. So whatever you do, uh, the scalar field will roll down the potential. And that divergence here tells us that the tachyon wants to roll down the potential. So it's almost expected that this thing here diverges. So that's why I dare to say it's still a useful example to illustrate modularity in action. It correctly computes a divergence that is expected by these considerations of the tachyon and its potential in the, in the bosonic string theory. 
Okay, and the very last thing I wanted to say about this bosonic game is, I highlighted that we are not doing level matching for the states running in the loop. And the reason is that the tau integral is doing the level matching for us, a posteriori. Namely, the integral over the fundamental region, it mostly contains an integral over the real part of tau from minus a half to plus a half. So for most uh, regions, the keyhole region will integrate from minus a half to plus a half for real part of tau. And that in turn enforces that q and q bar should have the same exponent. So for the largest part of the fundamental domain, level matching is, expo uh, is implied. But here's an interesting aspect about string one loop amplitude. Believe it or not, there is a little bit of unphysical states circulating in the loop. So in that sense, that one loop amplitude is a little bit more than just the sum of its infinitely many pieces. So that little area down here, we don't integrate the real part of tau from minus a half to plus a half. So there's a little bit of propagation of unphysical states which violate the level matching condition. But this is really part of the game. Yeah, so this is one fun fact about string interactions. So it's, if you wish, modularity, which tells you so. It's not a modular, meaningful concept to integrate over the strip. I mean, don't even think about integrating over the strip that extends to the real line, because this has an infinity of SL2 images. We can't do that. And the other fantasy, to integrate over the strip until the point uh, 1, or im tau equal 1, that's also not an option, because it violates modular invariance. So the only way out is swallow the pill, you integrate over the keyhole region, and well, there is a little bit of relaxation of level matching. Good. That's it for the bosonic side. And now in the next step, I would, yeah. Oh, okay. Indeed, indeed, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Well, <laughs> the only answer I know you repeated is this modularity. <laughs> okay, maybe that's something I uh, should try to read up, yeah. Does anyone else? No, or has ever thought about this? Right, right. So, indeed, uh, indeed, from QFT intuition, it's tempting to do exactly like, but Daniela suggested. But yeah, string theory being a theory of infinitely many particles, it's every now and then uh, escaping from the <laughs> scope of QFT intuition. I agree, yeah. Okay, in spite of unphysical states uh, in the loop, and again, it's really a mild violation of physical state condition, it's just the level matching part and not the BRST constraint. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah.
Okay. So I, I hope I'm tracking correctly what I hope I'm tracking correctly what you were just saying. <laughs> if you are lucky enough that you can write your modular integrand as a sum over various SL2 transformations, then you do what Roberto told you to do. You uh, write it as an infinite sum over SL2 images and pull out the sum out of the integral. Sorry, this equality happens within the parenthesis. So you... Oh yeah, indeed, this is undefined. Borel stabilizer is um, where I divide out by translations, right? So gamma infinity is, I think, plus or minus the modular transformation T to some integer power. Like that. Okay, yeah, I mean, this is a really delicate game with the Poincaré series. You need to choose a seed function that is preserved still by an infinite subset of SL2 to make sure that nothing uh, amounts to an infinite overcount. And I think here with this choice of uh, summing over that quotient by the stabilizer gamma infinity, that just means that in the second line you will be happy. I mean, the goal is to arrive at the strip. And I think that is precisely the defining property of the strip defined by, yeah, integrate all the way down to the real axis in the complex tau plane. So now this is uh, doing level matching throughout. <laughs> so this is from minus a half to plus a half in the real direction. But now you are moving below that unit circle. So you are really including an infinity of uh, modular images. Oh, shit. Yeah. So here, this infinity of uh, gamma images is uh, down here. Mm. But okay, to connect this with the starting point of the discussion, if f of t is a physical partition function, it's not set in stone that there's a physical interpretation to the seed function. Most of all, because it's highly ambiguous. I can just shift the seed function phi by some gamma action of a random gamma which is inside the sum here. Since this is so ambiguous, it is probably conceivable that there exists a non-physical representative. 
Okay, so this was a crash course in Poincaré series. <laughs> Good. Uh, the next thing I wanted to do is the superstring generalization of that vacuum energy business. I think I would be uh, opening up the textbooks of Polchinski and Green Schwartz Witten to settle that. And okay, maybe unphysical state is the wrong word. They are not violating the BRST constraints. It's a little bit like solving the simpler open string problem at first, building your open string spectrum, and all the states are BRST invariant. Now you can tensor these open string states with their counterpart under renaming alpha to alpha bar. So this is the second chiral half. And there's also a BRST charge for the right movers. So it is states which are still separately killed by left and right moving BRST charge, but they violate the level matching. So it's not a completely unphysical state, but it's a mildly unphysical state. OK. Um, Superstring partition function is next. And um, there are many commonalities to the bosonic string. Um, let's try to uh, catch the space of states that will be propagating in the loop of a superstring uh, one-loop amplitude calculation. And uh, again, we go to the critical dimension, which is in the superstring case, 10 space-time dimensions, or here, flat Minkowski R1,9. OK, so how to construct the space of states? Now, in the superstring case, well, they are again the bosonic oscillators and the space-time momentum part. So all the ingredients above come back. They all came from the embedding coordinates xi. And the only difference is that we have 16 dimensions less. So various ranges of indices are now a bit smaller than before. So various exponents in the oscillator contributions need to be adjusted. And I will once more follow the light cone quantization scheme, where two directions of space-time are, um, so to say, disarmed by the BRST constraints. So even though we are in 10 space-time dimensions, there are only eight directions perpendicular to the light cone. And uh, if the contribution from X is pretty analogous, then the really interesting part comes now from the fermions. And there are several options which type of fermions to use to describe the superstring. There is the pure spinner formalism employing space-time fermions, which is a fantastic tool to make space-time supersymmetry manifest. And for the purpose of this lecture, I will use a different formulation, the so-called RNS formalism, also slightly older than the pure spinner formalism. And here, we employ a world sheet spinner rather than a space-time spinner as a fermionic set of variables. And it's uh, not manifesting space-time supersymmetry, but space-time supersymmetry is there secretly. And we will see an incarnation of it shortly. Good. What happens in this uh, RNS choice of world sheet variables? They are now world sheet fermions creeping in. Again, they can be organized in terms of oscillators. And these oscillators are covering a world sheet Dirac spinner. Oops. In two dimensions, a Dirac spinner has two components. So the analogous Weyl spinners are pretty 
low dimensional. Okay, so there is a one dimensional chiral vial spinner, which is left moving, function of z, and there is an opposite chirality vial spinner, one component again, which is right mover. Okay, so the respective oscillators, psi and psi bar, belong to the first and the second component of the Dirac spinner, respectively. And on the support of the equations of motion, that field is meromorphic and antimeromorphic, respectively. Yeah, um, now that we are dealing with spinners, spinners are only well defined up to a sign. This is true for both spinner components. And hence, there are different modings to the Fourier expansion of Psi and Psi bar. There are two choices of moding. Pendent. I can keep the mode number m integer, as we did it before. So let's say here this subscript minus m of psi or psi bar can be taken to have integer n, and that choice of moding is referred to as the Ramor sector. But it's not the only consistent choice. You can allow fermions to have anti-periodic boundary conditions, which is to say you can afford to have half-odd integers, and that's called the Neve-Schwarz sector. And both choices contribute to the space of states. And um, there are some further remarks uh, on both Neve Schwartz and Ramor sector. One has to slaughter uh, a lot of mass levels in the Neve Schwartz sector. Um, Whenever you are playing with these half-odd integer modings, you have to project to an odd world sheet fermion number. So the world sheet fermion number it's just counting how many such psi oscillators do you see whose uh, moding is half odd integer. I mean, this projection only applies in that form in the uh, Neve Schwartz sector, at least when I do light cone quantization. And we do independently uh, the same for the right movers. So uh, with F bar having the obvious definition like here, but with a Psi bar instead of Psi. Okay, this is the so-called GSO projection, or at least this, its incarnation on the Neve Schwartz sector. And about the Ramor sector, uh, an important aspect of that is uh, that the ground states are degenerate. And this is the fault of the zero modes of Psi. So by saying zero mode, I'm anticipating that the L0 eigenvalue will be equal to that subscript here, M. So there are zero modes psi naught which, which have no contribution to the L naught eigenvalue. So you can view these zero modes here as operators mapping ground states to ground states. And um, in fact, since these zero modes obey a Clifford algebra, if you study their anti commutation relations, that ground state will form an eight component spinner of SO8.
So in the Ramon sector case, there is not just a single ground state, zero semicolon P, but there's an extra eightfold degeneracy. You don't really need to know it for this lecture that it uh, is a spinner index, but there will be a factor of eight in our counting problem. And of course, um, the same applies to the right movers. So there's similarly uh, another spinner index if you are in the Ramon sector for the Psi bar field. Okay, um, if I were to tell that story in covariant terms without resorting to the light cone, I would also speak of GSO projection here. You can view this as a projection to a chirality uh, choice for SO1,9. But for simplicity here, I do things in terms of SO8 vectors and spinners. Then we don't need to go into a description of that via GSO projection. Okay, we want to eventually get to a partition function. We want to evaluate trace of Q to the L0. And uh, the main work is to do things, things properly for the left movers, because then the right movers will be a copy, adding complex conjugation bars. So let's focus our efforts on the chiral contribution. from these uh, spinners psi to the space of states. So being chiral means that we are ignoring obviously the psi bars, but we are also ignoring uh, all the ingredients that we already know from the bosonic string. So these are the things that I'm ignoring now in writing down the chiral space of states or at least what I can do at the chiral level with the psi oscillators. So in the Neve-Schwarz sector, we apply all these psi negative modes to some vacuum. Well, it does, strictly speaking, have momentum, but that business goes through like in the bosonic string. So I'm not tracking the space-time momenta P here, and I just tell you that these light cone indices I run from one to eight, and that these subscripts here are um, positive half-odd integers. And as it stands, this is unprojected, so let's now implement GSO projection. I want to have an odd fermion number. So how can I enforce an odd number of these fellows? Well, with that definition of the fermion number operator F, it's simply that, the way we typically do projectors. Yeah, and uh, now the corresponding thing for Ramon sector is simpler. There is no more need for a GSO projector. So it's just applying these oscillators here to one of the eight ground states. So here I have explicitly outsourced the zero modes. I am only permitting these oscillator numbers to be one and larger. And now both these i's and the spinner index A takes values from one to eight. Yeah, here, that's a funny accident about SO8. The, the spinner and vector representations have the same dimensions. Yeah, so I have less than one page left of my notes. I don't know how we are on time, how hungry you are getting. Uh, feel free to take out your antipasto or your dinner beer. I'm not offended if you start the feast right here. And I don't think I will need that long to finish uh, this computation of the partition function. Okay, so um, here we were focusing on the chiral contributions from Psi. Let me now tell you how to assemble 
the overall partition function and how exactly to insert the information from over there. So, um, here this is superscript 2 for type 2, string theory. And I hope this was not confusing. Neve Schwartz or Ramon sector are decisions that you take independently for your left movers and for your right movers. Which is to say that you can be in the Neve Schwartz, Neve Schwartz sector, in the Ramon, Ramon sector, but also in a mixed sector being Neve Schwartz on one side and Ramon on the other. So there's a total of four options if you go through the closed string space of states. And uh, well, we have contributions from all, but actually two of them are getting a minus sign. And um, this has to do with the space-time statistics. This has to do with the fact that, well, traditionally, fermions in the loop contribute with opposite sign than bosons in the loop. Here it's a QFT wisdom that does go through for strings. So it's a negative sign for space-time fermions in the loop. Okay. So, um, let's assemble various bits and pieces that contribute. And first and foremost, there is that Gaussian integral over momenta. The result was im tau to the negative power of d over 2, where d is the number of space-time dimensions. Then, there are bosonic oscillators, and they are almost unchanged. We saw before that each species of alpha gives you such an infinite product, and likewise the alpha bars, the same thing with q bar. But we have to adjust the exponents. They are always d minus 2, so with our decreased critical dimension, that's only exponent 8. Okay, and now here comes that. Uh, chiral contribution from the psi as opposed to psi bar. So here comes the trace over the space denoted by H and S. And this we have to combine with the corresponding trace over Ramon, sector space of states. And the relative minus occurs for the same reason that you heard above. The relative minus occurs because of the space-time statistics that gets changed as you move from Neve Schwartz to Ramon sector. But now if you multiply out that thing and look at contributions in the Ramon Ramon sector, then you arrive at space-time bosons, or you get two of these minus signs. So this is all consistent with space-time statistics, what I'm doing here. Yeah, and most importantly, uh, it neatly factorizes. It factorizes, first of all, in regards to left versus right movers. That's good news, number one. But it furthermore factorizes in regards of alpha oscillators versus psi oscillators. Second piece of good news. And the efforts on the neighboring blackboard, they concern this chiral block here. So this, um, let's even give it a symbol, this chiral block. Let's denote this one by Z Psi. So that's meant to say the contribution from some unbarred Psi's to that partition function. Yeah, so the leftover work is to compute that uh, combination of traces over there. Okay, so once we have uh, this one fully explicit, then the partition function is uh, assembled from this formula. Yeah, and now how do we go into the nitty-gritty of this set psi? So let's first of all note that the oscillators square to zero, all of them. So these are fermionic oscillators, which can only be excited once and not more than that. 
Ups. Okay, and this means if I take a microscopic trace, I don't think this is well defined, but here I'm indicating that you should only look at a single oscillator and not at all the others say the mth oscillator. Sorry, this is a psi minus m. So this minus m oscillator is either excited or not. So in the unexcited case it's 1 and the excited case it's q to the m. So once more the Virasoro uh, generator has eigenvalue m for this psi minus m. Yeah, so this is one uh, central lemma that we will need. And I also need to handle this GSO projector. I also need to handle traces which have an extra insertion of world sheet fermion number. So what happens here? And once more, this is meant to be a microscopic trace, only looking at the mth mode, which can be unexcited. Then we don't even care about the fermion number or it is excited, but now the fermion number flips between being excited and being not excited. So now we have a relative minus sign, which we didn't have over there. So this is an important uh, difference that oh, inserting the minus one to the F operator is uh, producing additional minus signs. Okay, so now we have everything lined up. Uh, now we can go for infinite number of these microscopic traces. So now we can go ahead and trace out this entire HNS space. So it's just a matter of assembling enough copies of these uh, 1 plus q to the m and 1 minus q to the m factors. Okay, so the way this is done is um, we take infinite products similar to the case of the alpha oscillators. And here this is never Schwartz sector, so my moding number is half odd integer r. And uh, we have eight directions out of the light cone, so eight species of psi oscillators. Yeah, and now I have only uh, worked with the formula up to here, including the one-half. And here is the extra piece from the presence of minus one to the fermion number. So I need to do the same, but now with a relative minus sign explained above. Okay, so this is the partition function for the GSO projected chiral neve schwartz sector, or at least the contribution from the psi's only. Yeah, this is probably the more subtle part, because in the Ramon sector, the most subtle thing is the factor of 8 that I commented on before. So in the Ramon sector, no need to wrestle with the minus 1 to the fermion number operator, and we just get this uh, infinity of oscillator sums, again to the power of 8. Yeah, so this is to be inserted up there. And I forgot to comment on these factors of inverse q to the a half. So this is the same story as uh, in the bosonic string. Think about potential tachyons. Or think about the vacuum energy on the world sheet. And here, this is not, a ta not an actual tachyon, but it's a would-be tachyon that gets removed from the GSO projection. So it is a would-be tachyon at level minus a half. And it's only threatening you in the Neve Schwartz sector. There is not even a would-be tachyon in the Ramon sector. That's why we don't need to GSO project.
yeah, now that we are in the midst of this, uh, the GSO projection may look pretty ad hoc. If all you want is get rid of the tachyon, it may appear like a super cheap solution. However, it's modularity which gives you a real underpinning why GSO projection is the right thing to do. So, uh, in the ne next five minutes and in tomorrow's lecture, we will see in more detail that GSO projection is really uh, implied by modularity. But for sure, it's as a highly pleasant side effect killing the tachyon. That's why I wrote would be tachyon. Okay, um, let's finish uh, this computation of the partition function. So, remarkably, uh, this chiral block, the way it's defined, it turns out to vanish. So, we spent the last 20 minutes poking at zero. But, okay, I think we needed to go through a couple of manipulations to even smell that it's potentially zero. So, if I isolate the different pieces, GSO projected Neve-Schwarz sector, the part with the fermion number operator, the part without fermion number operator, and if I furthermore combine it with the Ramon sector partition function with a relative minus sign. This is a Q-series. Ideally, we want to study it as a whole, but we need theta functions to do this properly, so let's relegate this until tomorrow. Let's say for the moment you're a Mathematica user and expand that order in, by order in Q, and you will find it's zero at each order in Q that your computer can do without choking. But it's a not so hard proof if you have theta functions and a couple of Riemann identities among them. So all this to say, the partition function here is a zero simply because these chiral blocks here vanish. So if this uh, object here vanishes, then multiplying it with other stuff won't alter the vanishing. It just means that uh, the contributions from space-time bosons are in exact balance with the contributions from space-time fermions. So, what we have just shown is, we have derived, well, derived modulo the theta function identity which will be delivered tomorrow, we have derived space-time supersymmetry of the spectrum. Or, strictly speaking, Bose-Fermi degeneracy of the spectrum, that the counting matches of bosons and fermions. So, this is to say, or well, the above vanishing result can be rephrased as saying that these two diagonal sectors, where the space-time bosons are sitting, have the same number of states at each mass level as compared to these mixed sectors, where the space-time fermions are sitting. ST is space-time. Here are the space-time bosons, and here are the space-time fermions. Okay, if the title of my lecture series had supersymmetry in it, I could now show off that this is in lines with the title. Unfortunately, my title is not supersymmetry, but modularity. And we, with regards to that title, what we just learned is of limited use. Well, we wanted to compute a modular invariant integrand, and we got zero, which is, at the very least, in lines with modular invariants. So for the moment, let's just say that the vanishing of the partition function, which we just derived, is trivially compatible with modular invariants. And the goal of tomorrow's lecture is to remove the word trivially, um, to do something interesting with it. We want to have a non-vanishing one-loop amplitude. Well, the vacuum amplitude is not good enough. 
we need to put in some external legs to get a non-zero result and to really appreciate the modular interplay between the Ramon sector and the GSO projected Neve-Schwarz sector. Maybe you can anticipate that we wouldn't get zero if I were to drop the GSO projection, but I guess from here, you, it's not so convincing. So we should really go through the four-point function tomorrow and see all the modular structure in that. Okay, sorry for going over time. I'm done for today. <laughs>